So today we have Lauren McCarthy. She is an artist based in LA. Uh, could you give us a quick background? Sure. Um, I'm an artist <laughs> based in LA. Um, I'm a assistant professor here at UCLA Design Media Arts. Um, but my art is basically thinking about uh, what are the systems we use to be a person and interact with other people. And um, will technology save all of our problems or cause many more? Do you have an answer? Um, yes. <laughs> so at, like at the footer of your website on your about page, you wrote, I make art about what confuses me. Is that still true? Or is your website old? Oh yeah, no, it's definitely true. Um, I, the main thing that confuses me is just people. Um, <laughs> all of them. <laughs> um, so I make art about people and about, um, you know, this, uh, the sort of expectations we have of each other or, um, w the rituals and the patterns and the, the strange things we do when we're together or alone. Hmm. And so I guess to give people some context, can you just like reference one of your projects that, that is about people? Sure. Yeah. Um, so maybe to give an example, um, I did a project called Social Turkers a few years ago, and I was uh, trying to see if I could fix my my non-existent dating life. So I made this system where um, I went on a series of blind dates with people that I met on the internet, and then I um, sort of discreetly streamed the video of the date to the web, and then I paid uh, people through the service called Amazon Mechanical Turk small amounts of money to watch the date and try and give me instructions for what to say or do to see if that they might be better at kind of coaching me or directing me through this this date. And uh, was that successful for you? Um, yeah, to some extent. <laughs> Maybe less successful than I had hoped, um, but also less successful than I had feared. Um, yeah, it, the thing that it did really was make, I, I guess one thing I'm always trying to do without getting too philosophical here is um, understand like what are these limits we put on ourselves and so for me to get these instructions oh yeah so they would come as like text messages and I have to do them or say them immediately um, and so just having to do these things and not being totally in control um, felt really uncomfortable at first but then also like started to become really natural um, but the thing it made me realize was like I could um, say or do things that I felt like oh that's not me or that that's totally weird of me to do and then like the date would not you know act like it was such a strange thing to say or do and so I, like the sky didn't fall and so I realized what a narrow box I normally hold my idea of myself in and so what that project was really successful in doing was um just getting me to like kind of loosen up my it's identity, I guess, in some way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is it, they had no idea that this was going on while you were doing it? They didn't. And that was part, you know, I didn't, I started out with these where I would tell them at the beginning of the date, because um, that, you know, it wasn't a, supposed to be at this secret thing. But the problem was that the whole date would be um, just talking about the project and about the issues around it and surveillance and art, and which was great, but it didn't feel like a first date then. It was just them at, quizzing me about my art practice. And so I switched to uh, like telling them at the end or after the fact, just to try and get a more, get this feeling that like, this is this thing we all do. We don't talk about it yeah. while we're doing it. And so was it um, just really eye-opening for you to give up control and let other people like basically do the date for you in a way that like made you more comfortable with other people over time or was it just that individual experience that was just different yeah no I think it did have some lasting effect where I I sort of felt a, lo a looseness that came from that project um it like almost by giving up control I started to feel more freedom mm -hmm. in some way um but the other weird effect was that like immediately after the project, I had gotten really used to uh, the system that like I, for the first few dates, I felt really like unsure about how to make a decision. Like, you know, like, can I kiss you? Or like, do you want to come home? With, like, or do you want to have a second date? And I was just like, I don't know how to determine those things anymore. Oh my God. <laughs> it, like, have you wanted to jump on the other side and like control other people? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, less so. I have less of a, maybe my controlling of other people is just by setting up these situations and asking if they'll participate. 
Um, so I was wondering yeah. with like all these projects, if you, um, if you're just attracting more people like you to run the date for you. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> I get all these socially inept people as my, as my Turkers. Huh? Maybe. I don't know. It is interesting though with a lot of these projects where there's different roles. I talk to someone and, um, they immediately are like, oh, I want to be this on this side of it, or I want to be on that other side of it, or I want to do neither of those things. Mm-hmm. And, and for every person, it's like really clear in their head, but different. That's so crazy. And so was there a moment like before all of this, like the art projects got started, the programming got started, that you, you recognized that you were having difficulty interacting with people? Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and so then yeah. like throughout your, did you study all, uh, art in college? Yeah, um, I studied computer science and art, um, and I maybe the the maybe this is the source of all my problems. But I went to MIT, where it, like I feel like the one thing I didn't learn was any social skills, um, and so I, I never felt that like inadequate in college. It was like immediately afterwards where I was like, oh wow, all these people know how to like interact with each other. Where did, when was I supposed to get that one? <laughs> so I was like, well, what can I do? I can like kind of hack things. I guess I can build software maybe that would help <laughs> but it seems like you're you're in this interesting place in between right because you also had the your javascript thing which was uh p5 js which is like about opening up art and technology as a whole right so there are obviously like larger issues you're trying to tackle as well or is that just because you found that like you went to mit so you were given the aptitude to get into programming and like make art and you felt that people couldn't do it Um, yeah, no, I think it's, uh, so I have this feeling where I don't, I think part of my social anxiety or awkwardness comes from just a feeling of like, I just don't know how to fit into a lot of situations. And so another place where there's a big problem with people fitting in or feeling welcome is in tech in general. Um, and, uh, I think that was what really got me interested in like working on this P5JS project. It was, um, and not just tech, but like open source is even worse, like um, in terms of like the gender breakdown or um, minorities that are involved. And um, so I was just trying to see like, what would it look like if the number one goal of this project was to build a space where um, people feel welcome mm-hmm. and um, use that as a starting point, not like, oh, we built this cool tool and then, oh crap, like, can we get some more, uh, you know, different people in here after the fact? Um, and yeah, so that's, you know, I, I like JavaScript and I like building this tool, but that is the, the core for me. It's like, can we make a space where like people just feel comfortable being there, even if they don't know yet how to code or they don't know how they fit in or they don't know the other people. And is that working? Like, what about this pro this particular like um i mean it's it's an entire like framework right for mm-hmm. building stuff yeah, yeah. um what about it is attracting those people um i think it's part of it is the design so if we have that core value of like we want to support you know diversity and different points of view from the get go part of that goes into um design decisions about the tool itself like trying to make the uh like the language itself understandable the the functions in the library um trying like putting a really heavy emphasis on documentation Mm -hmm. so it's not this barrier where you have to figure it out it's like someone has actually helped wants you to learn um and uh and also actually doing things behind the scenes so taking some trade-offs in the um code like under the hood to make it easier for people that are not like expert developers to still be contributors to that code base. Um, and so adding a lot more um, commenting in there and just doing things in slightly less um, sort of obscure ways. That's really cool. I never thought about that, like just opening up like exactly how you comment to make it better for people to jump in and like be open source contributors. I always thought about it as much more like end consumer facing, like um, yeah, I guess processing. Um, and, and so has this netted like different kinds of projects? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the... The user base is so much uh, broader, and we really try to highlight that. Um, so that's the other piece of it is like 
actively doing events or curating homepage sketches or galleries or um, doing outreach and like working with specific groups and being like, well, what does it mean, um, you know, in your context? What what are the useful examples? Or like, do maybe we need to translate this all to Spanish? And then what are the relevant like examples or concepts there? Um, do we need to like change the metaphors we're using to teach instead of like assuming that you use the same object that we're talking about? Um, so yeah, the projects are just, they reflect, you know, a wider range of people and like yeah. different ideas. Um, and are, are they like chiefly art projects or, or what? M mainly, um, but I think it's being used in a lot of other contexts too, like visualization stuff. I see it like in news and like blog posts kind of things as a um, showing data or making some point. Um, yeah, it, it's I think wider than just art. Okay. For sure. So one thing that I did want to talk to you about was the Facebook mood manipulator. Are you still actively working on that? Is that existing in the world still? Um, I it exists. I don't think it works so well. Facebook kind of changes their underlying infrastructure uh, very regularly. Okay. So so then <laughs> um, just explain how but, it worked yeah. in the past. Yeah. Um, so it it actually I made it in response to this news in like twenty fourteen or something like that, where it was like. Um, oh, Facebook is like did this study about mood manipulation where they were showing people um, either positive or more negative content and then showing that this would uh, cause the person themselves to make more positive or negative posts with the uh, conclusion that they can actually influence your mood based on what they show you in your feed. And the outcry was all about the procedure and like you didn't get the proper permission, like I can't believe Facebook is experimenting on us. Um, which is like a whole different conversation, but I was more interested in like this question of like, wait, yeah. but they can like control our moods. Like I don't have time to be mad about them experimenting right now. Like what about this issue? Um, so the Facebook mood manipulator was this uh, uh, Facebook add-on you could get that basically would give you this interface that um, you could, it had a few metrics like positive, negative, but also like, um, optimistic, pessimistic, I think, or um, open or uh, private, something like that. Yeah. I forget exactly now the And then how would files. it actually interact with the it, interface? Yeah, and so you get to select how much of these things you want to feel in a given day, okay. um, like when you wake up, and then it filters your um, posts accordingly. So it was, um, it was using this uh, method called linguistic inquiry word count, or a LUC, L-I-W-C. Um, that was actually the same uh, method that the Facebook mood manipulation study used. And it's, it's pretty like straightforward. It's basically just looking at the words in a post and trying to tag them at, with different um, qualifiers. You know, this is a positive word or this is a pronoun. And then all of these different, you know, end results like openness or uh, hopefulness are based on per what percentage of the words are in this category or that category. So you just like add it up like an equation. Have you thought about doing a version two, like post 2016 election to yeah. see the other side of Facebook? Yeah, I actually, I think they've, I've seen some things like that, like to see outside the echo, echo chamber. I wonder, I wonder what it would be, what would be the appropriate add on now? Cause I think now people are so used to that idea. Like, of course they're manipulating my mood. Of course, yeah. you know, they're filtering out certain things or targeting me. It also seems difficult given like how much like app and like mobile browser traffic they have right now. I guess, it's, I mean, I don't know how much it's changed since 2014, but I imagine it's gone up, mm -hmm. um, which is super difficult. And so what, um, have you done many other extensions? Um, a few. So one that comes to mind is this uh, extension for Google Hangouts yeah. that I made with Kyle McDonald. It was called Us Plus. Um, which is kind of a play on Google Plus. Um, and the idea is that you would install it in your Hangout and it would um, measure what, it would do speech to text and like measure the words that you're saying and analyze them. And then it would also analyze your uh, facial expression and it would try to kind of optimize your conversation and then give like feedback individually. So like I might be, it might notice that I'm like being much more negative or pessimistic than, uh, my conversation partner and so it would show me an image like stop being such a downer or something like that or um, my favorite feature was if you are talking a lot more than the other person it would just auto mute you <laughs> you've been auto muted for talking too much until there was more of a balance 
<laughs> to me, it's so surprising that you like you're the one building these tools when you seem to have like a very high EQ for other people. Mm. Maybe you don't feel that way though. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what the answer is. I feel like I am very sensitive to other people, but then I just like my output. I always feel like <laughs> lost. Like I'm like, okay, this person, like I'm supposed to say something reassuring or like, you know, make the situation comfortable right now. Like, but what? What? No, what do I say? <laughs> I, I think more people have that feeling than you think. Yeah, maybe. Because um, there was also that like box project you guys made, right? Um, what was that one called? Like the tell, it would tell someone what to do on their date, like at a certain point in time. Oh, oh, the Converse Cube. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. These ones. Oh, yeah. Is that what you're talking about? I didn't. Yeah, it, it was, was green. green. Yeah, 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 it was green this in the video. Is the, this is a special version we made for our wedding. Amazing. Uh, <laughs> so they were silver to match the color theme. Um, yeah, this was a project I did uh, a while ago. It was called Converse Cube, and it's just like a centerpiece for uh, conversation. And it would kind of sit in the middle of your table and detect like who was talking and then try to give you just single one or two word cues of what to do or, or actually what to say or talk about. Was it parsing the conversation or was it just like throwing random stuff out? Um, yeah, it was, it was listening to the conversation and um, I can't go into the specifics of that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, a lot of these projects are sort of a, working with people's um, kind of desire to buy into things. Um, and, and not in a superficial way. It's like you give someone a product and you tell them it does something and they really start to, they kind of want to believe it or they, they so like with the Us Plus project, I was talking to this reporter and we were doing the interview over Us Plus and she was, you know, towards the end and she's kind of like, well, you know, this is great, but like, is this really working? It, these feel sort of random, like how, how smart is this thing? And I was about to explain how like, yeah, you know, speech to text is not that great. And you know, the analysis we're using is actually supposed to be for longer bits of task, whatever. Um, but that, at that moment, it's like, it's a, like, stop being so doubtful or something. And she was like, oh my God, okay, I'm gonna go write the article right now, thank you. <laughs> so it's like, we remember these moments where it works for us and we forget more often the times where it just doesn't work. Are the, the physical objects more effective or less effective than the, like the plugins or the websites? Or? Uh, I think they're more effective in the sense that like, it's amazing what a, a physical object can do to just give people like an excuse. Mm -hmm. And so that was part of the thinking with the Conversa Cube because it was like, you know, people are really just starting to get smartphones and, or uh, for it to be more widespread. And I was like, what about this thing that we're all carrying these objects around? Like that's that's interesting, what does that mean? Um, so yeah, I think having an object, people are instantly like ready to just sort of act differently or like put aside some of their normal patterns and see what this thing does in the space. Um, the apps and extensions are nice though because it, it means I don't have to like get objects to people. It's like anyone can download it and the reach is so much wider and what I really like about it is this question of like, okay, so you saw the little video trailer and you have, maybe you feel upset or excited or confused, but like then you could just click download and do you. And if you do, then like, you, how do you use this app and why? And like, you really have the choice. It's not just something you see and like muse about. It's like a real choice in front of you. Hmm. Cause I was wondering like, how often you get pulled toward like commercial interest with these projects? Because I think like we were talking before we start started recording about people asking you to like make a startup or or misunderstanding the project as a startup. Do you ever feel like I mean the cube is a perfect example like to the desire to do like a giant Kickstarter for something like that? Yeah, sometimes I I did this. I also had this like happiness hat that would detect if you're smiling and then like stab you in the back of the head until uh, you started just smiling again to, to train your brain. And that one, like, people were really, like, writing me, asking to buy them. Um, I guess for me, it's it's um, just, like, how I know how much... some I've seen friends do Kickstarters. I know how much time goes into just, like, figuring out manufacturing and production and everything, and that's not where I want to spend my time particularly. <laughs> um, so I think, like, the software gets to that point of mass distribution so yeah so one thing that i am curious about is like how people do consume and even buy digital art or digital media in general um 
I know that like you, you make, you know, websites and apps and stuff and not everything's physical. So it's like kind of hard to sell, but where do you see that going as far as like people consuming and purchasing it? Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting because I don't think anyone has found the ideal model yet. Yeah. I know a few artists that have found something that works for them. Um, like they have a specific contract they use for selling a website or transferring ownership of something, but there's not like one uh, universal way of dealing with it in the way that there is with like, you know, selling a painting or something like that or selling a sculpture. Um, And there's also the trickiness of just like, uh, if I sell you a digital file, what is there anything wrong with like just making a copy and giving it to someone else? Like, is there some difference between the copy of a file or the, the original, um, or if I sell you a, a you know an app and the app no longer works with your current version of your phone, is that still an interesting right? Thing are you to like own? now the project manager forever? Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> so people it. have different ways around this. Sometimes there's contracts for how long you maintain something, mm-hmm. um, but yeah. So for me, I don't. Uh, the only context in which I've kind of sold an app before, um, well, usually it's it's free because I'm just interested in people trying it um and that's not where i'm trying to make money but one time i made uh this app uh that a lot of people it got put got to the like the front page of reddit and so all these people started downloading it and i hadn't really built the server for that (laughs) use case i was expecting like you know maybe a thousand people at most um and so i needed people to just like stop downloading so fast so i just like added a price (laughs) and then like a few hours later I felt like oh I feel bad like I just want this to be free but I in that time I made like a few thousand dollars and I was like oh well that works yeah Yeah. (laughs) did Um, did you refund everyone or did you keep it no I just I think you know you bought it (laughs) during that one window when it wasn't free (laughs) like the bad luck window (laughs) yeah Uh, that's really great that's like the exact inversion of almost every other company (laughs) (laughs) Um, it's interesting because I was wondering about like why there aren't more digital artists. I know there are like, there are obviously a lot of them, but like more prolific, more like really well known. And I was wondering if that like, that issue around selling and buying stuff is actually a part of it. Cause like, you know, if you're a painter, if you're the rare combination of someone who's a painter who also has some like business savvy and can sell stuff, like you can survive. Whereas like someone like you, like you, you teach at UCLA, which is awesome. But like, that's not solely your art, right? And yeah, I'm just curious, like what, what like innovative models artists are trying to like push on right now to try and create that stuff. Or if you think that like maybe everyone becomes artists and it, this is just like the side thing for lots of people. Yeah. It's, um, I think part of the, the difficulty comes out of just like the market around buying and selling art is very conservative because you are agreeing that this particular object has this value that, you know, and it's all kind of consensus based. So there, it's very risk adverse in the first place. So anything digital is like, first of all, just like new and not necessarily like we've established this is art and it's okay. And then also like, how do you own it and how do you keep it? And there's all those questions. Um, but I've seen like different models, you know, um, there's, you know, things like electric objects where you can, uh, which is a platform for people to distribute images. And they've tried like a number of different subscription or selling models. Um, I was talking with uh, someone at a company recently where they are trying to use the blockchain as a way to like sign, uh, kind of like verify the the originality of a digital file. So you might make a copy, but you wouldn't have the bitmarked one or something like that. Um, and, uh, but I haven't seen any model that really like has worked or has caught on in any way. Um, so yeah, I don't know what the answer is. I think that there is one. <laughs> I mean, the thing is like, um, it, it, I think it used to be like, oh, there's these like digital artists and you're saying like, they're still not really represented in like the art world at large, but also like every artist is starting to use technology now like seeing these you know I teach in a program that uses technology but seeing the grad students in fine arts like they're all like making gifts and using computers and using like 3d software so I think they're gonna have to figure out something because this is not going back into the box totally or you have to get really good at painting or something yeah. <laughs> um so is there like what are you really excited about right now like what are you what are you working on um I'm I don't know if 
excited is the right word, but um, I've been like really obsessed with uh, just all this home automation stuff and thinking about Alexa and um, products like that, Google Home, and it's it's so interesting for me compared to something like Google Glass, where people were kind of there was this huge like rejection of it when it came out, whereas with Alexa, I see like, oh, my parents have one. Actually, they got like two more for Christmas just because they liked it so much. Or like, my grandma's got one, or my friend has one. And it's like, nobody is uh, having such a knee-jerk reaction to it. And I think they are selling it really differently. Um, they kind of like, don't make it too smart at first. They roll it out. It's like, oh, it's just like a smart speaker. Um, and they don't talk about like all the really technical things that could be done or they are doing already. And I think that is like coming really soon. It's like first we have to get people used to like the talking speaker and then it can be like the talking speaker that controls everything and like knows every detail about you and streams it all to the web or whatever. But um, yeah. so, and, and for me, it's just like so um, provocative that it's in the home um, and to think of like the home is the place where you our first, you first learn how to be a person and like talk to people. You under, you learn what your culture and your values are and what you know your history is. And a lot of that is shaped by like your interactions with your environment. And so then if you've got this device or this home system that is answering your questions um, or talking to you in a certain way or shaping your interactions, like how does that change? And like that's a pretty small group of developers that are designing these things. With very, you know, sort of limited set of experiences or views. Um, how do you account for like the huge range of people that might be using this? So that's, that's what I've been thinking about. Um, and then the project that I'm working on is um, I'm trying to become uh, um, like Amazon Alexa. So, but I'm making a service that's called Lauren. Um, and so the idea is that I, will come into your home and set up all these devices and cameras and then I'll watch you and uh, you know control your home for you and try to be like better than Alexa you know try to anticipate your needs try to care more um, try to you know imagine what what would this relationship with your home smart home be like if it was like really taken to its full potential wow so now like you're exactly on the opposite end of the dating app Right. Yeah, like like yeah, yeah. I guess so. Then the, this is you were asking earlier about yeah. um, whether I ever control people. So I guess, or I'm, if I'm ever on the controlling end. So I guess in this case, it's you're exactly that. Yeah. yeah, no. I feel like all, all of your projects have like basically trained people to deal with computers as like empathetic things because they think, at least, that there's someone behind it, yeah. operating it. And now you're like, we've reached an AI, and now you're leapfrogging it again to like become the human behind it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I Well, so another piece of this is thinking about these services like um, TaskRabbit or Uber or like where, or uh, Mechanical Turk where you've got some human on some side of it and you, the, depending on the service, there's a different amount of like humanness to this person that's working for you. Like Amazon, Mechanical Turk, like they're just like an ID number basically. Um, and I've seen these like really interesting ads, uh, I don't know, interesting, but ads for like TaskRabbit where it's like lifestyle photography, like woman in her home drinking a cup of tea and it's like, like life post chores, TaskRabbit. And I'm like, oh wait, but like the chores are still happening. Like it's just like there's a person that you don't see that's doing them and then this one, wait. Like, yeah. <laughs> not like we eliminated them with technology. Um, so it's, kind of, you know, that's another angle on this project is like, what is the human behind the scenes? And like, I don't know, are they enjoying this? Is this, uh, are you completely at the service of this other person that tries to imagine you're not there? Or, um, or is it actually like this relationship in this case where like I might have some connection with them? Or is there any place for a human to still be better than a uh, artificial intelligence or it's like you know Alexa gonna be able to do this really soon and I'm actually not as good <laughs> like, well I think that that's the bet right like the low-level tasks or the repetitive tasks get automated out and the hopefully like creative like high-level knowledge work tasks are remaining but I have no idea yeah I mean I think the things that uh, that's how we like we like to think that like the things that get automated are the easy things and the things that don't are the ones that require more 
education or training or higher level skills, but actually I think it's, it divides more like the more human sort of emotional labor is the stuff that just can't get automated. It doesn't have to be high end. It could just be like the person that greets you at the door. Right? That's like, it, it's harder to replace that with a robot than driving a car, which is a more complicated skill. So when you have all the cameras set up around someone's house and you're like observing them, uh, do you ever feel that like you're going to just develop this incredible amount of empathy and become really attached to them and then have difficulty when they like turn off the, the Lauren device? <laughs> yeah. And then I'm just out. Yeah. Um, yeah, I do kind of wonder. I, I think actually what I'm trying to do with all these projects is just, um, I realized like bootstrap myself into a place where I get to have this like connection with someone. Um, and part of that is because I just feel so bad at doing that, like over, like, you know, I'm with my friend at the coffee shop and he just strikes up a conversation with the woman behind the counter. And I'm like, I, can't, I don't know how to do that, but I'm going to build this like huge elaborate system. And then maybe through that, while I'm watching them brush their teeth and like helping them, we'll have some, you know, human moment together. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, maybe a little bit of that. Um, I, the plan is that if you sign up for the service, there's sort of a consultation and we talk for a moment and beforehand and just so it's not like totally random person. They don't necessarily know me well, but they have some sense of who this person is. Yeah. And we kind of talk about like, what would your, you know, what do you want Lauren to do for you? Um, what, and then try to enact some of that through when it actually happens. Okay. And so the deal is that your physical body is not going to like enter the house. Like you're never going to do like a chore for them. None of that. But like you can engage like an API with other services. Yeah. So I'm building the system where like I'll be able to turn on it and off any electronic device. I can like see who's at their door, unlock it or not, depending, <laughs> like turn on their shower or not, or turn it off. Um, and they can also talk to me like, you know, Lauren, what's the weather today? And I respond, Dude. but I have <laughs> Wait, this like, how many <laughs> hours are you going to clock? With them? <laughs> um, well, so I think it will be, I, ideally it would be like a year or something, but oh it, I think it will be like three days or something because, um, what happens with a lot of these performances is that people kind of sign up and they don't know what to expect. And then usually it's very interesting and kind of intense, but I don't want it to be like, too much that you know it's like you want to go to a movie and have some different experience but you don't want it to be like so much that you can barely deal with it so <laughs> um i'll limit it to it like some shorter number of days where like they get a taste of this feeling okay you know? and then you're like on the clock for like a few hours or something well for the whole time during that like three days or so but like i can sleep when they're sleeping and i'll build a system that tells me like wakes me when up when their light goes moving. on or something yeah. so what about that um Cause that was, wasn't it the electric objects project where you were like on people's Facebook yeah, pages? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Well, explain that one. So the idea there is a little bit convoluted, but they, so electric objects made this, they had this idea, like anyone should be able to support art. And so they made this Kickstarter that was like $5 and you basically, your $5 goes to commission for artists to make a piece of art. And the, the, only requirement for the artist was that they had to incorporate the people that had supported them in some way. And so what I, and so you could ask them for a question or like, oh, give me your photograph or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I asked them for all their social media handles that they wanted to give. And then uh, for all, there were like a thousand backers total. Um, I spent five minutes looking through all their social media. And so I set up the system where I just like cue them up and like show me, open all their tabs and I would start scrolling. Um, and so this would, you could see it, watch it online. You could go and see exactly what I was looking at. And then also in the corner, like a little box that was like a camera on me, um, of me, like, you know, reacting to their stuff. Yeah, as like I a screen through share it. thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so it it lasted for a week. I did like eight hours a day or something and then yeah. got through all... 1,000 people just like. <laughs> and, and did you give them any feedback or was it just you as observer? Um, I liked things sometimes. I, w I didn't want to get like, I only had five minutes, so I didn't like comment or yeah. anything like that. But um, yeah, it was mostly just me observing, but it was also real time and I was going alphabetically. So you could kind, there were actually a couple of people that happened to watch while I was like browsing them. Um, and that was kind of cool. Well, because I just wonder, like, if in a similar vein you start creeping people out, like, mm. knowing that they're being watched by you. Yeah. I think that will be a, a weird part of it. Um, 
And then the question is like, well, does this feel le more invasive than like, you know, Google drop cam or less? Or if you know that like uh, it's a human, but like I, your, your camera's not going anywhere. I'm, you know, I'm the only one that will see it versus it going into some archive somewhere potentially. Are you going to like log like advertising terms and try and sell them stuff? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> you know what you need right now. You have to go like full Should circle. I, yeah. yeah, exactly. You want me to order you some of that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I, I actually heard about you like three or four or five years ago when I was running this thing called Comedy Hack Day, which was basically just building apps that were funny and then de demoing them on stage. So it's just a hackathon with like funny projects. And I came across all your stuff all the time because people would just send it to me. And what I always wondered before I met you was like how in on the joke you were. Like if, if you're <laughs> yeah, like, does this girl know this is funny? <laughs> people are laughing. Yeah, like if you're just this person who's like giving a talk <laughs> about her project and like you keep getting like applause breaks and you like don't realize it. Like, you're like, I'm just trying to like learn how to interact with people and then everyone laughs and then you like keep presenting. Yeah. And so like meeting you now, I like get the sense that you're very in on the joke, but like how much of your intention is to make this thing that's actually functional that helps you interact with people and how much of it is just to be like point at something and be like, this is interesting. Maybe it's funny as well. Mm -hmm. Um, well, first I just love that you didn't, you're like, is this, does this girl have any idea I was laughing at her? Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so it's definitely, I, I get this question a lot and, um, or sometimes it's asked like, you know, are you optimistic or critical about the future? And I'm like, yes, <laughs> both. <laughs> um, and then they say, which, and I'm like, well, whichever, what the opposite of whatever you think. <laughs> um, but no, to more seriously, like, um, I feel like it's impossible to say, you know, this, any one thing is like a bad or good or the right track or the wrong direction um yet we are asked to respond to things so quickly it's like you scroll through it and you're supposed to be like i like that or i i'm gonna write an angry tweet about that thing um and so i really want to just like make a space where people can just like consider things for a moment and sort of imagine what it is we're getting ourselves into um and so i i find humor like a a way to do that because you know you laugh and then you kind of there's always some truth to every joke um and so people uh it's it's less like let me lecture you about this thing we should all think about and more like here's something ridiculous now what, what if i tell you that's the future <laughs> yeah i mean it's yeah. like I, I used to work at the onion and like we yeah, the term was exactly. like flintstone vitamin so it's yeah. like kind of the sweet thing but it has oh, some amount of nutrients i like that <laughs> yeah and it's like basically your projects too right yeah, like yeah, yeah. i uh and I wonder, like, on the flip side, like, why so much of this, like, near future science fiction Black Mirror type TV content is, like, almost across the board negative and, like, fearful. Whereas, like, your stuff, which, like, more often than not, like, catches some attention online when you release it, and it's, like, funny. And there don't seem to be as many, like, really negative, like, uh, it, the world is ending artists, but, like, yet the media is, like, the exact opposite of that. Um, do you have any idea why those like shows are successful? I think they tap into a fear that people have. Um, and then yet they present in a way that is sort of like relatable and not just like, you know, doom and gloom headline. Um, but I think for me, it's like important. I guess that's part of it. Like, yes, we feel scared. We feel uncertain. Things are changing quickly. We don't know what's going to happen. Um, some things seem definitely going in a terrifying direction. Um, but we can't just like unwind or rewind or we can't just stop it from coming. So how do we move forward? And so for me, it's like essential to find the parts that are worth keeping that we are excited about and try to like do more of that. Um, and so I guess with all these projects, it's always like this layering of both of those things. It's like, yes, there's the fear, there's the, that is totally messed up, like, what's going on? But then there's also the part where you're like, oh, that's kind of nice, you know, I just followed this person around all day while their <laughs> phone was, like, broadcasting their location, and, like, we had, like, a really sweet time. <laughs> like, that was weird and great. It's um, cool. Like, have you ever used, like, WeChat, where you can just, like, shake the phone and connect yeah, with someone? Yeah, yeah. It's, like, very yeah. pointless, but kind of sweet. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Have you, um, have you like dug into your projects and tried to like retain people in your apps for longer periods of time Mm. to like create a lasting effect or a more lasting effect? That's such a good question. Um, I guess not. I guess, um, I mean, there are a lot of like friendships that have sort of come out of these projects and then I'll continue to, you know, then they you know, watch friends. a webcam in their bedroom. Right. Or not <laughs> less of that. Um, I mean, I actually met my husband through one of these projects, um, <laughs> which is I was do- when I was doing the social Turkish thing, he was actually, um, happened to be one of the people watching and giving advice on like the last date. Um, and then like wrote to me afterwards and was like, wow, this project was so interesting. Like l- I would love to meet up. And then we, um, yeah. So crazy. Yeah. So it did work out. Yeah, so, yeah. Like, <laughs> right. So people always ask if that project's successful and I'm like, well, I mean, yeah, I kind of, I got a husband out of it, I guess. But like, I would, yeah, that'd be a success. <laughs> yeah. class, but, is it like, but not the way you met someone think. who was yes. like helping you interact with mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. And, um, and what's his attitude toward other people like? Like, obviously, or maybe not obviously, he likes to be on the computer side of your projects, or does he like to be told what to do, interacting with others? (laughs) Um, He needs no instruction. He's just, like, totally comfortable. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. He's comfortable with computers. He's comfortable with people. Yeah. I just keep him around for, like... You're just jealous. Yeah. (laughs) Just trying to learn. And so so what is he? He's a digital artist as Mm -hmm, well, right? Yeah. What kind of stuff does he work on? Um... Well, so we work on a lot of projects together. So we did this Us Plus project that I mentioned. Um, his He's maybe a little bit uh, dives deeper in some of the um, theory and technical things that are possible. And so um, right now he's working on a lot of like machine learning experiments and um, doing some really cool stuff with that. Uh, recent Before that, he was really uh, focused on computer vision. So he did this one project where... Um, he had this like pile of uh, mirror balls, like disco balls, and then he was um, had a number of projectors that were aimed at them and a number of cameras, and the camera would like m- detect where every single surface of every single ball was, and then project the proper pattern so that when it bounced off of the balls, it would create these patterns on the walls that look like really wow. cool morphing like you know arrangements that were all like s- super calculated based on all these. <laughs> Angles of reflection, yeah. That's pretty technical. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool, though. <laughs> yeah. Man, and so, okay, so if someone, like, likes your work, like, and what's his name, just so people know? Oh, Kyle McDonald. Yeah. yeah. And so if, if someone likes your work or Kyle's work, um, and they want to start doing this kind of thing, where would you, like, where do they get started? Do they go to art school? Do they learn, like, processing? Mm, what do they do? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think tools like processing or P5JS, um, open frameworks, Arduino for electronics. Um, these are really great places to just start messing around. Um, school is great, but I don't think it's like necessary at all. Um, I think what's really actually exciting about these tools is that there are these communities of people um, online, and like you know, artists have always been good at making community. But I think especially digital artists, like that, is where they go to find each other. Um, and so I would say just. Start experimenting, hang out, hang out online, try to figure out like what, I guess the biggest thing is um, like, what is your unique way of looking at this stuff or working with it? You know, a lot of, it's easy to make something sparkly, but like, what, what do you have to say or what do you see in it that's different than what others do? Do you find that by like contemplating or do you find it by just doing stuff? Um, I think it's different for everyone. I just start with like my anxieties and work from there. (laughs) Oh yeah, I guess that's pretty obvious. Um, But yeah, I think doing stuff is usually a good place to go if you haven't, if it's not coming in your thoughts. (laughs) (laughs) Cool. And um, like, I guess wrapping up, like what are, um, for people in art school, like what is your advice to them? Like how, how could someone make the most out of it? Um, hmm. I think, so, a couple of things, um, you know, and the thing you'll probably hear from your teachers is, like, this is your moment to take risks and to fail, and you should do that, and, um, you know, that's pretty easy, (laughs) but um, uh, the people are the thing that is really special about grad school, you know, you're, the network that you make with the teachers or the people in the community and the alumni, but especially, like, your peers in the program, these are the people that you'll continue to run into and connect with um, through your life. And 
So just to take, you know, not to be so focused on your work that you don't connect with the people around you. Um, and then the thing I wish I had known um, was like to ask questions. Like I always felt like I was supposed to know what to do and I never had any clue. And so I just tried to like get through without getting in trouble or something. Yeah. Um, but now I have all these students that are just like asking me questions all day long and I'm like, and I'm like, wow, I wish I had done that. Like, I could have gotten so much value out of this. Like, I didn't know you could ask anything. It's incredibly helpful. I'm Like, when I was just starting to, to, like, do some Python stuff, like, having that mentor that I could ask really dumb questions to made all the difference when it came to just, like, I would learn things that I wasn't even intending to learn. Because yeah. they're just like, oh, you just do that, and then it works. And you're like, oh, God, I wish. Oh, man. Um, I, and then my last question for you is uh, just like influences. So um, artists, I guess, most obvious, uh, but then like any kind of like books or, or film or anything like that? I would say artists, uh, you know, ones that are sort of further in their careers that I'm looking at are like Sophie Kahl, um, Jill Magid, um, both of them kind of dealing with surveillance and watching in really personal ways. Um, a lot of like performance artists, um, like Touching Shay, who like, uh, tied himself with a rope to his collaborator for a year and they didn't separate and I just think of this as like you know we're doing all this like interaction design but like all you know a rope can like change your life right I don't think they spoke to each other after that project ended yeah. wow <laughs> um and uh yeah and then I guess in terms of uh movies um Oh, it, actually, inter I read a lot of books and I read a lot of fiction. Um, my favorite is like Joyce Carol Oates, um, and because I heard that like fiction changes your personality, um, and so I'm only really trying to like do that. <laughs> However, I can change my yeah, personality to anything. better interact with people. Yeah. Like, what do I need? <laughs> I'm not sure Joyce Carol Oates is like the one that you want because yeah. usually her characters are really twisted. Um, and I also um, love this movie called uh, Synecdoche, New York where it's like this artist kind of building this world that he sort of loses himself in. But the last scene is like him listening to this, oh, this is spoiler alert, uh, um, this audio tape uh, where he's got these headphones and, and it's like instructing what to do. And it's like, go up the stairs into this like set of a house, he's, world he's built. And it's like, go up the stairs, lie down in bed, close your eyes, now like die, go, like something like that. Like, that was like the end of his life. Um, yeah, so that's my dream for end of life. Wow, care. I think we're <laughs> yes. definitely going to get there. I mean, we're probably there right now. Yeah. <laughs> Just like write an audio book. Um, cool. All right. So if someone wants to like learn more about you, follow you online, where do you like publish stuff and where yeah. can someone find you? Um, so website Lauren Dash McCarthy. <laughs> yep, that's right. Dot com. Yep. Um, and yeah, you can go there or you can. Um, and that's where I publish most things. Like most of my pieces are first kind of released online as videos or um, interventions. So you might not even know it's my work, but you might see something pop up that are is out outraging people in your uh, <laughs> social media feed or something like that. <laughs> and there you go. Yeah. That's you. And um, will you be doing anything this summer that people can like check out? Yeah. So I'm doing this home project um, and I'm actually going to be open soon for signups um so you can look out for that and potentially we can uh i can come watch you in your home and <laughs> control everything <laughs> and that'll um, be on your like uh your website your twitter account yeah, or something yeah, okay, both perfect. of those um yeah and then the i guess the other thing to check out is like p5js.org which is this um platform that i uh, lead the development of if you're interested in you know making some code art yourself okay thank you yeah thanks <laughs> you're <was> great <laughs>